This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all, filth all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Amen. I'd ask if you would turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be uh, reading 22 through 25. And as well, if you would, turn your bulletin and locate the sermon insert or the bulletin note insert. As well, use that and follow along with me as we walk away through this passage. We began last week looking at the incredible call that God's placed upon our lives as God's people to love one another. And Peter, in this passage, explains how we can do that and why we should do that and how important that that is. And we got halfway through it last week. This morning, we'll finish this text as we continue our study. Brothers and sisters, please stand together with me as we read God's word. Hear now the word of our King. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege that you've given us as your covenant people to come here this day and fellowship around this portion of Scripture. From the beginning of time, O Lord, you sought. Now, Lord, we pray, send forth your spirit, grant his unction in the hearing of your word and the study of your word. That, Lord, these words would not just fall upon deaf ears, but that they would penetrate deep within our, our being. And they would transform us and make us more and more a people in love with you, a people passionate to serve you, a people zealous for good deeds unto your glory and praise. So, Lord, bless this time. Give me grace to preach your word with fidelity. Wed this to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we read of Christ's message to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now, these were little churches at the time when Revelation was written, um, seven of which, I've got a map there in front of me. It's not the best map in color. It's a lot better. I apologize. Um, but I think we've got a little map there of those seven churches in Asia Minor. If you know that the west side of Asia Minor is Ephesus, at least the Mediterranean, then you can see at least, imagine a little more. These were little churches, and yet while they are literal churches, nevertheless, most um, scholars to today, most evangelical biblical scholars today recognize that, that these seven churches are far more than just literal churches, but they are representative of all the churches that exist in the interadventual period, which is from the time Christ rose to the time he comes back. These, these are the kinds of churches that will exist during this era. 
Revelation 1, we get that in a couple places. Revelation 1, 10 through 13. John describing how Jesus Christ currently tends His churches. We derive from this passage that glorious truth that Christ tends His church. And with these words, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of the trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me and having turned, I, I, um, I saw seven golden lampstands, which we learn in chapter 2 and 3, it, it uh, represents each of the, the uh, churches. And in the middle of this lampstands, one like a son of man. So we recognize that, that John in chapter 1 sees this, this vision of Jesus Christ tending to his churches, of which there were seven. And then chapters 2 and 3, he then writes letters to each of these churches. But with each of these letters, every one of these letters, they end with this phrase, he who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Each one of these exhortations was intended by Christ to be an exhortation to each individual church in this era, in this age, during the last days. So we recognize that Revelation 2 and 3, these letters to, to the churches, is um, gloriously instructional for us as God's people. And it raises the question, which church are we? I would, three notes in that regard with regards to Revelation. Number one, would you notice, you got the map there. First, would you notice each of the churches, the kinds of churches that you'll find today in the world? There are seven types. You've got the loveless church, Ephesus. The persecuted church, Smyrna. The worldly church, Pergamum. The church indulging in mysticism and Baalism, Thyatira. The dead church, Sardis. The healthy church, Philadelphia. The apostate church, Laodicea. Again, each of these represent types of churches. And again, you have to ask yourself, when you look at this passage, what is Bethel? What is the church in which we live and minister? Second point I want you to notice is that, if you look at that map, that God, Christ, John organized the progression of these churches in a circular manner. Starting with Ephesus, it goes from Ephesus to Smyrna, to Pergamum up north, then over to the east to Thyatira, down to Sardis, then through Philadelphia, then on to Laodicea, and then obviously back to Ephesus. So this was intended to be a circular letter, which is what the prison epistles were. They were intended to be read by not just the Ephesians or the Colossians or the, or the Philippians, but they were intended to be read by all the churches that, um, as this went around. Galatians was a circular letter intended to be read by all the churches in the region of Galatia. And so likewise, the book of Revelation was a circular letter intended to be read by all the churches. And the last point I want you to, to notice, while John could have started with any church, it is significant that he chose Ephesus because of their problem. You say, wait a second, it's a port city. Patmos is just a little bit um, west. Of course he'd choose Ephesus. It's a port city. Brothers and sisters, Port cities, you've got as well, Smyrna was a port city they could have started at. And Pergamum, though it's not a port city, it's close enough to a port that they could easily get there. So you just can't say, well, they had to start there from Patmos. You didn't. So the fact that they started there is significant, and I believe personally they started there because of the nature of the problem at Ephesus. And what was that problem? They were loveless. They struggled with love. And brothers and sisters, in the Bible, that is a big deal. Understand that. This is a massive issue. A loveless church or a loveless Christian. Christ said in Matthew 22, when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, On these 
two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. That's an incredible statement. The two commandments of love are the essence of every command given in Scripture. Jack Miller wrote these words in reference to this truth. Notice the quote. Under God's direction from Jesus, we learn that the heart of obedience of any command in Scripture is to love others. You know, it's, it's easy to externalize our religion. We go to church regularly, we pray, we fast, we tithe, we do everything that is required of the religious person. And as a result, we congratulate ourselves. We think that's the essence of Christianity. It's doing these religious things. But the very heart of the law, the very heart of every religious activity you could ever do, the heart of every commandment of God, is a call for us to be merciful. Do you love others? Do you love God? Have you missed that what God desires is that in all your relationships, you be touched by a spirit of compassion, that you be merciful in your basic approach to people? Unquote. Incredible statement. If indeed that's right, and we know it is from God, that the law is summarized by love, then we recognize the intent of every commandment ever made is for us as enabling us to love God more and to love each other. And if your service in the kingdom of God and your diligence to, to uphold God's word results in you loving God less or not loving God's people, you have become a Pharisee. No matter how warm you may feel, no matter how consistent you may be in God's word, you have become a class one Pharisee. Incredible. And that is why, no doubt, Peter began, in his, uh, as he transitions from his opening um, statements um, to his call to be holy, one of his first exhortations from that call addresses love of the brethren. You see, this is a persecuted church, and persecuted people... Uh, they tend to retract. When you're persecuted, when you're not doing well, you tend to retract and the flesh comes out. And when you retract and the flesh comes out in the midst of trial and difficulty and hardship, it's easy to be found to, to be biting and devouring each other. Is it not? Think of a, of, of, of a drowning man. A drowning man. This man may love God. This man may love people. But if he's drowning and his life is on the edge. He's about ready to go under. What does a typical drowning person do? They lose their brains and they grasp and they'll cling to anything or anyone, even if it means killing that one. In their mad craze, they pull people down in their need, in their lust for life. How many Christians missing the life that they've got in Jesus Christ are pulling people down in their lust for life? Pulling people down, ripping people, biting people because they don't have any resources beyond themselves. That's what persecuted people, that's what uncomfortable people, that's what people in difficult times tend to do. The flesh ekes out. And that is why Peter comes and exhorts them, brothers, in your context of, uh, of your persecution, these men and women of that Peter's writing to in Asia Minor, the very churches that Christ would write to 30 years later. These and the other churches in, in, uh, in Asia Minor, and thus throughout the world. But these ones were being persecuted under the Neronian persecution. And he says, guys, there's a lot that you're going to lose. You might lose your house. You might lose your health. You might lose your money. You might lose a daughter. You may lose a, a, a spouse. But don't lose your love for the body. Now, how do we do that? As you just said, drowning people, Christians are not. They're sucking life. They want life. And so they suck anyone or, or, or anything they can. They, they try to suck life from it. And so we try to suck life from our spouse or our children or our parents or a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or our bank accounts. 
We're, we just want something to, to give us a sense of, of, of uh, fulfillment and significance. And so we, we cling to, uh, to these things. And when they let us down, that's when we bite them. And that's when we uh, consume them, says Paul in Galatians. How do you love the brethren? Well, we saw last week, our second point, the ground of the, uh, of the command. And that ground is, is in us not looking within, not looking without, um, horizontally, but it's you and I engaging in the call that God's placed upon our lives in salvation. That gentle, that, that, that simple call is to enjoy, to glorify God and enjoy Him. It's to sit His feet, and it's to do more than just simply in your prayer life say, God, I know you're holy. It's to enjoy God. It's to genuinely sit at his feet and, and love God. John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's not a threat. That's a glorious announcement of the gospel. Grow in your love for God. And loving the brethren, you'll have so much love in your life. It'll just, all, it'll just ooze over into other people. If you love me, that's where we begin. And we see that in our passage before us. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls. Those are all language of salvation, regeneration. You've been regenerated. Now that you're regenerated, fervently love. And what's the point of regeneration? It's to indeed exalt God by enjoying Him. Enjoy your God. And you will grow in your love for other people. Enjoy your God and the fears and the worries and concerns of this life will banish. Enjoy God and you don't care how much you lose when the persecutor comes and knocks at your door. Enjoy your God and you'll willingly give up your life, your health, your future that you might glorify and enjoy and enjoy one another. So that's the, the command that's the ground. That's what we looked at last week. This morning, now let's look at the glory. Brothers and sisters, the glory of this uh, command. If you can grasp this day the blessing that awaits you in loving the brethren, your life will be radically changed. Do you know the, the blessing that awaits you when you stop trying to get life from the things around you, but give life? your life will be radically changed. Notice the text. We're still in 22. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for, circle that word, ace in the Greek, for a sincere love of the brethren. When I memorize this vocab word, ace, it's a preposition. We memorize it as two unto. We translate it to two, or we translate it unto. It can be translated as, as for, but it, its base is two unto. Well, it turns out, it's not the primary word for two. I'm going, you know, throw this ball to. That's more of a dative. But the, the prepositions you might use for the word two would be pros and epi. Wouldn't be ace. That wouldn't be your first choice. Ace, however, in the study of Greek, has a very, very unique usage in the Bible as unto. Let me explain that to you. And I'm going to use that with a, by via a metaphor. In the U.S. is a place called Death Valley. It's between Nevada and California, Mojave Desert. And it is the hottest place on the earth. In 1913, it recorded the hottest ambient temperature ever verified on the surface of the earth, or on the earth, 135 degrees. So it is as hot, if not hotter, than Iraq, the Arabian Desert. In 1972, verified, the surface temperature in Death Valley was 201 degrees. Average rainfall is 2.35 inches a year. Think about that. We'll get one good, one good rainfall, we'll get two inches. They get 2.35 inches average in a year, which means many years they don't even get that much. In fact, the reason why they get so little rain is I was reading about it. I, this is, I may say it wrong, so if anyone here knows about rain, 
you'll go, man, are you ever wrong? For, uh, but, the, but, but what I read was, it is so dry that when rain clouds come, it sucks them in essence. It sucks them dry. There, 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 there is no rain that falls in Death Valley. Very rare. Very rare. Imagine, though, with Death Valley, if you and I were to make a machine, so now we're in fantasy world, we make a machine that is designed to water Death Valley. You change the ecosystem. Now, you'd start slow at first because otherwise you'd wash all the dirt away, but you'd start slow, and, and over the course of two or three years, you give it enough water so that it, it would be um, in a tropical zone. And what you'd see is this dry, arid, arid death place would be transformed before your very eyes into a lush, beautiful, green valley. It'd be gorgeous. And especially if we kept people from building there over the course of 10 years, 20 years, it would become a paradise. Now, you could say then that that machine we made was unto life and death value. Ace. We, we, we made the sheen, this uh, machine unto ace life. Now, that, now, that's not the fact. Don't think of it in terms of Okay, the fact of the matter is this machine produced life. That would not be ace. That would be pros. That'd be epi. But ace would be if you and I enjoyed it. Unto life. That's you and I walking in the valley in the cool of the, of the day, enjoying the beautiful trees and the waterfall and the glorious lake and, and, and the pristine beauty. So if I wrote, this machine was unto life in Death Valley, that would mean you're in Death Valley, enjoying Death Valley to its fullness. That's the word here. Let's read it then. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified yourself unto a sincere love of the brethren. Do you understand those, those first two phrases? We understand as regeneration. Since you've been obedient to the truth, to the truth of the gospel, been transformed by the renewing of your mind, transformed by God's grace. You've been vivified. You've been regenerated. Do you know why God vivified you? Do you know why God regenerated you? Unto the full enjoyment of the love of the brethren. That's what this phrase is saying. And from that, therefore, we conclude two truths. One, one of the reasons God saved us was to bring us into a holy communion, not only with himself, but with each other. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has an eternal plan to enjoy the unity of the Godhead for eternity. And in, re and in his creation, he created a people who would enjoy that unity with him. That's what heaven's about, new heavens and earth. And with each other. When you were saved, you were brought into this unity. You were saved unto this unity, unto the enjoying of the unity of the Godhead and the unity of us with the Godhead and the unity of us with each other. That's life. That's redemption. That's what God saved you for. That's what this text says. In fact, listen to John 17, 20 through 21. Christ said, I do not ask in behalf of these alone high priestly prayer, but for those also who will believe me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us. We were saved to participate in this relationship of unity, this relationship where we are unto God and unto one another, giving, giving, enjoying. And then he closes, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Interesting. By this all men will know you are my disciples. How? When you and I are unto the love of the brethren. When you and I participate, engage in the reason God redeemed us. Yes, to glorify God, but to enjoy Him. And how do you enjoy Him biblically? By enjoying who He is and via this glorious means of fellowship, loving the brethren. And that's why Paul is so strong. 
When difficulty comes in our lives, someone stamps on you, someone can bites you, someone scratches you in the body of Jesus Christ, Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? 1 Corinthians 6, 7. I mean, brothers and sisters, do you understand? You have been saved to this glorious end that begins on this side of the grave. That's why we call eternal life. The best definition of eternal life is not ceaseless existence, but life pertaining to the age. What age? The age to come. That's what eternal life is. You began living the life that you and I someday in its fullness will enjoy without sin. But we've begun that in the state of sin and misery. And God's purpose and our, our redemption on this side of the grave, therefore, in this context, 1 Peter 1, is to enjoy the love of the brethren to which you and I have been saved. And that means that we don't go there to get love of the brethren, as we've seen last week. It's not about what you get, it's what you give. You've been redeemed to bless other people in the body of Jesus Christ. With what? With the word of God. Isaiah, the Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. What word? God's word. God gave me the tongue of disciples that I might, my entire life now is about sustaining weary ones with the word of God. Saying it means one, three. God comforts us in all our afflictions so that we might be able to comfort others in the affliction with which we have been comforted by God. Christianity is about enjoying God, enjoying that unity, and enjoying the unity of the body of Jesus Christ. And when you and I give ourselves to those things, we begin reaping life on the earth. Life indeed. Or, John, the higher life. Not a second blessing, but that for which God made us for. And secondly, we conclude that we have been, if that we have been saved unto the love of the brethren tells us something rather important, fulfillment. Realizing that for which we have been redeemed, that's fulfillment. Fulfillment comes not when we get what we want in life, but as we give ourselves to the Lord and to each other. That's Peter's point. And you're being persecuted. You're losing your house. You're losing your health. You're losing your future. You're losing family members. You're losing everything. In our world, Satan has, pulled, has, has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving so they may not see and hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Hence, the world in which we live values those things so much such that you and I see that value and we go, man, I'm second. I, God's, God's done me short if I don't have money and if I don't have health or looks or, or marriage, or kids, or, or name it. I've been, I've been given a raw deal, a bad hand. And Peter comes and says, brothers and sisters, you haven't lost anything. You've gained everything in Jesus Christ, and if you and I will simply invest in that which is eternal, on this side of the grave, which is God in love of the brethren, which ironically and once again is the fulfillment of every law ever given so that we might love God more and we might love the brethren more. Talk about fulfillment. Let me give you two examples of that, opposites. First from, is from uh, 1 Timothy 5, 6, speaking of, of wills in the body of Jesus Christ who give themselves to wanton pleasure. These are widows whose husbands died, maybe left them some money. And as Christians in the body of Jesus Christ, they're living, they're, they're using that for themselves. They're not using it to invest in the body of Jesus Christ. They're not teaching the younger women. They're not name it. They're rather just living it up, thinking that life is about what you get, right? The winner is who, who, who has the most toys at the end. How much pleasure have you had? How much things have you enjoyed? And don't, mis don't misunderstand, I'm not necessarily talking about pleasures of amusement parks or, or highs of mountains. I'm talking about the pleasures of just having a good marriage, having a healthy family, having a healthy body that you can run and not grow weary for a lap, right? <laughs> we think that's what life's about. So do the lipo, do the facelifts, do it all. Stay young, look young, feel young. That's what this world is all about. And there were these women who bought into that in the first century. And, Christ, and Paul said, she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. 
You understand, brothers and sisters, if you and I invest in the things which are perishing, it will rot out your soul. You want to know why there's health and wealth churches today? Because so many people's souls are rotten. We, we want something to fill the sense of emptiness, the sense of void. And so if it's not the things of the world, it's, if it's not the things of our lives, we're going to look for it in religion or drugs or, or facelifts or, or, or hobbies, name it. And when you and I give ourselves to those things thinking life is that, you're no, longer, you, you, you're no different from the drowning Christian who's grabbing anything and everything they can to lift themselves up. And all those things do is weight them down so that they fall faster under the, the water. It rots your soul. Read Psalm 32 and you'll see a Christian whose soul is being rotten from the inside, rotting from the inside out. And they kept quiet about my sin. Thy hand was heavy upon me all day long. Read the verses of what it did to David when he was seeking the high life, seeking the good life. And it just ate his soul to pieces. In contrast, Listen to Psalm 133. David wrote these words. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Now he's talking about existential blessing. As I've titled here, the glory of the command. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard. Even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It's like the dew of, of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessings. Life, did you get that? Life forever. David says, do you know what love of the brethren is like? It's not theoretically thinking of these things. It's participating in the ordination of Aaron, first priest. Can you imagine how excited you'd be? You'd be filled with joy and gladness as God provided. You'd be, you'd be inspired to want to serve God as God provided. Or think of the dew of Mount Hermon. You may not know this, but the ecosystem, when I do a Bible survey class, the first chapter we talk about is the, is the land of Palestine. And we look at the ecosystem, we see how Mount Hermon waters all of Palestine. It's not the Jordan. It's Mount Hermon. It, it, the the snow-capped mountain in the day, enough moisture evaporates that it goes south over Palestine. And in the morning, all of the land is filled with dew. So that place is habitable. That place is a place of life forever because of the, because of the experiencing of the dew. Brothers and sisters, you have life or death before you. If you give yourself to the love of the brethren, first love of God, and then the love of the brethren, you're going to be greatly blessed in this life. That doesn't mean you're going to have money and easy days, no. But spiritually, you will get a better taste, a greater su uh, supping upon that for which God redeemed you. But if you and I go, nope, I choose to live otherwise, you and I will, will reap death. Not spiritual death. I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm saying you will have existential, emotional, relational struggles in your life. So not only is love that the chief command for any church body as a Christian, we saw that last week, but it is a command that comes with healing, satisfaction, fulfillment, and joy. You're tasting. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what you're doing when you love God and that love overwhelm, overflows into the love of the brethren. Now, there may, may be some here who say, wait a minute, you're telling me I got to forgive. I got to love. I got to care for. I got to be other to people who have hurt me severely. And no, I'm not saying that for a minute. This text is not calling you to be gracious and kind um, because of the infractions of someone who's hurt you dearly. No, this text is calling you to be gracious and kind for all the infractions of that individual. Keep fervent, 1 Peter 4, 8, we'll get there eventually. Keep fervent your love for one another because love covers not just one 
a series of transgressions, but a multitude. You know what that means? Sins beyond you could beyond counting. A multitude of sin. If you and I will give ourselves to the love of God and then to us saying, I'm going to bless the enemy. I'm going to bless the one who hurts me most. I'm going to pray for their blessing. I'm going to be kind to them and gracious to them. I'm not going to come and, and be mean. I'm going to give. Your life will be transformed as you enjoy Christ. Now get that. That's first. As you enjoy Christ and then as you give Christ. Your life will be transformed and the valley of weeping will become the valley of joy and celebration. That's the blessing, the glory. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified yourself, you've been regenerated and redeemed unto this glorious paradise called loving the brethren. This valley, plush, green. He says, as that's true, fervently love one another from the heart. Now, the question is this. Can we rely on this, <laughs> Peter? Really? I mean, that's good advice. And what you just said, uh, preacher, sounds pretty cool if it's true. But is it true? That's the question. And that's where then Peter goes in his next point, his last point. The, app the ap applicability of this calling. Would you notice this calling, brothers and sisters, is true. And it never grows out of um, out of. Uh, it, it never becomes out of vogue. It's never out of um, style, out of season. It's always in season. Not just for those being persecuted, but for the rest of the interadventual period into the new heavens and the new earth. Notice 23. For you have been born again. Once again, a perfect tense. You were regenerated in the past, which has an always present reality to it. You have been born again, regenerated with the intention that there would be this always relevant implication of your regeneration. Now that I'm regenerated, talk to me, Peter. You have been born again, get this, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. Now, he immediately be, he starts talking about procreation. And he's, con he's uh, contrasting. So a child is conceived in the womb, develops grows, matures, and in nine months, 20 months if you're an elephant, um, praise the Lord we aren't, nine months later, a baby's born. And, but you know what's crazy? If you step back from time and you look at that baby, look over the big picture. Every baby that's born is born with a terminal disease. Spurgeon wrote, of this verse, every newborn has received the evil virus that was first infused into us by the fall. So we're terminal. So we're born, we are generated in our mother's womb, we are born only in the end to die. But not so with God's regeneration. For we've been born of seed in the Greek sperma, We've been, we've been, we've been um, fertilized by the sperma of God's word, which is imperishable. You know what that means? It will never end. Life pertaining to the age. You've been, when you were regenerated, God regenerated you. So I'm not talking about loving the brethren yet. We're not talking that. We're just talking about regeneration at this point. When you were regenerated, you were regenerated unto eternal life. Life pertaining to the age to come, and it'll never change. Ever. Spurgeon then wrote of this. When we are born again, we receive a nature that is, that is indestructible which is not to be consumed by fire, drowned by water, weakened by old age. Did you get that? Your salvific, your regeneration, your soul that God revived is not weakened by old age, smitten down by a blast of pestilence. It's a nature invulnerable to poison, a nature that shall not be destroyed by the sword, a nature that shall never die. Incredible. When God vivified you, when he, when he regenerated you and gave you life, that life that he gave, this life, unlike the life you and I got when we were conceived and born, this life is eternal according to the age to come. Incredible. Now, okay, how so? 
Well, that's verse 23b. Because you were born again through the living and abiding word of God. In the beginning, God spoke his word and generated the world. In in regeneration, he speaks his word and you become a new creation. And that new creation, unlike the first word, which created the world that was tarnished, God allowed that. This creation will never grow old, never be tarnished, never fail, never perish. Why? Because it was according to the word God spoke. It was according to his word. Okay, you got that? Well, so it's according to his word. Big deal. Okay, Isaiah, six, Isaiah verse 40, or chapter 40, verse 6b through 8, Peter quotes, 24. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. He's referencing the common grass and the delicate, uncommon flower. <clears throat> so he's looking at the entire scope of the world, the common to the uncommon. All of it is going to wither and fall off. But in contrast, the word of the Lord abides forever. He's quoting from Isaiah 40. Now let me give you the background real quickly of Isaiah 40 because it's glorious. Isaiah 40, remember Isaiah 1 through 39 was written to the generation of Isaiah 740 B.C. But Isaiah 40 through 55 was written to the generation of the exile. The generation in in 605, 597, 586, who would have their lives turned upside down as they were transported to Babylon. So 40 through 55 was intended for that generation. And then 56 through 66 is intended for for the generation that would come back. Isaiah 40 is intended for the generation that just lost everything. But they went to exile with a simple promise. Do you remember what the promise was? God would restore them. Now, the flower and the grass in Isaiah 40 is referencing the nations surrounding God's people. There are good nations and there's bad nations. Good nations, the help. Bad nations, the hurt. They're going to come and go, says Isaiah. Guys, it's, guys, in exile, the Babylon that you're under, and these, these different places, pretty soon the, the Persians, and pretty soon the Greeks, and pretty soon all these nations that threatened and are such a big reality, they come and they go and they're gone. But the word of God abides forever. That promise that God made to restore you will by no means ever get out of date. It will always be a reality. Peter, knowing the glory of that verse, says, how do I prove to you that what I'm telling you is not just my opinion, but the word of Almighty God? Well, because it's according to God's word. And you know what God's word comes with? It says the flower, right? The the grass withers, the flower fades. And Peter clearly, as the commentators say, uh, point out that is in reference to the persecution. (laughs) To the peoples who don't know Christ around you. Man, they're good people who might hide you and protect you. They're not, they don't know Christ, but they hide and, pre- and protect you. And then there's those evil people who torture you and delight in torturing you and delight in taking your homes. This is Peter to the persecuted people. But don't miss it. The word of the Lord abides forever. So if there's one thing you're going to count on, it's this, that God's word will never fa- fail. It will always, always um, um, endure. It'll always be applicable. It'll always be in vogue. And guess what, brothers and sisters? This, the command about loving God and loving the, the brethren, that you were saved unto that love, and that your most glorious point in reality will be to love God and love each other. That you that, that passing through the valley of weeping, it doesn't have to be this horrible time just because the finances are short, just because the health's gone, just because the house is gone, the job's gone, and life is difficult, and all these horrible things are going on, filled with conflict and difficulty. You don't have to walk around with your head down going, woe is me. Why? Because you have that which supersedes all these things, that goes beyond these things. And that is the word that was preached to you, says Peter. Do you see it? The applicability of what we're talking about. Brothers and sisters, you could purchase all the monies in the world. You could purchase 
all these homes and all these things and all these blessings and they'll rot your soul. Or you can go without all these things and just have Christ and give yourself to the end of the law, which is loving God and loving the brethren. And you will be the most envied person in the world. God's word says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Man, affliction comes. It may be in the form of our jobs, difficult relationships. But brothers and sisters, if you and I respond in the flesh by grasping at the things that we think we need, if only my spouse would do that, if only my parent would do that, I could, I, my life would be perfect if my parents moved, changed my home to be like this. I got to get out of my home. I got to get out of this place. Brothers and sisters, if your answer to get away from a bad situation is to flee, you're exchanging one rotten condition for someone, something that will rot you even further. No, our call is not to flee. Our call is to enjoy God. And then, counterintuitive, bless the one who hurts us. Do good to the persecutor. Someone wants to come and smack your cheek. You know what that means, right? That day, if you smacked a cheek, you'd smack with the right. Give them the other cheek doesn't mean, well, what it means is, is to give them the other side. And, the, and the, the most horrible insult in the ancient world was to be smacked by the back of the hand. Turn the other cheek. That doesn't mean you're a doormat. It means willingly be despised. Willingly be those things so that the overflow of God's love might overflow in you to love those people. That's what Peter's saying. Man, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. By this, the world will see, says Christ. In the verse I read at the very beginning, how when you and I enjoy the unity that is found in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's the word that was preached uh, to you. Now, I, I say this in closing. We look lightly upon laws. Unfortunately, we do. There are so many laws on the books today that we don't follow. Right? We're lawless people. We don't follow these laws. But when you hear the laws, you go, why would I follow that law? For example, let me give you a, a law. If you're driving at night through rural parts of, of Pennsylvania, state law, still on the book, still requires that you stop every mile and send up a rocket signal. Did you know that? Yeah. And you hear that and you go, I'm not sending up a rocket signal. You're lawless. That's a law in the books and you're not doing it. In Hartford, uh, Connecticut, it's against the law to educate dogs in the city limits. limits. Did you know that? You can't do dog training in the city limits of Hartford. I love this one. In Cleveland, Ohio, women are not allowed to wear patent leather shoes in public. In Michigan, a bride's hair is the legal property of her husband. So, uh, as such, it's illegal for a married woman in Michigan to get a haircut without uh, the permission of her husband. It's on the book still. And we laugh at that law. My favorite. In Memphis, Tennessee, women can't drive a car unless there's a man with a red flag in front of the car warning the other people on the road. <laughs> that is still on the books. <laughs> My wife is coming. Watch out. But see, we laugh at that. But this, the, 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 the bad part is, is our laughter of that turns into laughter over all the laws. And provided they're not big laws like murder and things like that, we're lawless people. That's the nature of sin. Sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. Because we're lawless people, we don't mind disobeying the law as long as we don't get caught. And so we have this mentality that the law is, 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 is passing and weak and it doesn't matter. Peter comes and said, brothers and sisters, there is a law. That is unchanging. As, as Christ said in Matthew 5, 18, not the smallest of strokes shall, small, shall fall away from the law until all is accomplished. Everything's important. And God's law tells you this day, Christian, take it by faith. Stop clinging for life, trying to suck the life out of the people in the horizontal realm. 
You've been saved to have a relationship with Christ. Enjoy that relationship. And that will overflow to you by faith, blessing the enemy. All of us have Alexander Coppersmiths in our lives. I say this in closing. We all do. Who've done me much harm. Think of this. If that Alexander the Coppersmith is a believer, then not only will you spend eternity with Alexander the Coppersmith, who've done you much harm, but you will spend eternity loving Alexander the Coppersmith. And there will be great blessing in that. And that blessing begins on this side of the grave. Love Alexander the Coppersmith. Pour your heart out as one who has who is, who is feasted upon Christ. Pour your life out and you will indeed know the blessings of the Lord. Let's close it in prayer. Father God, give us the grace as your people to be a church characterized by the love that you describe here. A regenerative love, a, a love that, that, that comes only from supping with you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters as I pray for me. Give us the grace this week. One, to be in your word. But then two, God, to not just be in your word as a check mark or to be in your word for a fun fact, but that, Lord, we would be in your word that it might enhance our ability to spend that moment, time, that morning, enjoying you. God, grant that your people would learn how to sit in worship, genuinely adore, And then, God, I pray that this would fill us and in the strength of the Lord that we would be used by you to bring the face and affections of Christ, the love of our Lord, would spill out to other people, to our family members, our children. God, we pray, therefore, strengthen us in the inner man and woman unto your glory and praise that we indeed might be a place where we would be guilty, charged and found guilty of loving each other. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.